When discussing human-level AI, people often picture massive data centers filled with powerful computers. But what if we've been getting it wrong? What if the human brain isn't quite as limitless as we've always assumed? I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. In addition to AI work, I've developed software for several neurological test instruments and neural simulators, and along the way, learned a lot about the capabilities and limitations of biological neurons and how your brain must work to do the things it does. I founded the Future AI Society to pursue these ideas, and we're writing many aspects of them in the Open Source Brain Simulator 3, and I invite you to participate. In this video, I'll look at what is needed for human-level AI in terms of memory capacity. In the next, I'll look at the needed computational power. I think you'll be surprised by my conclusions about both. I'll start with the conventional wisdom. Then I'll describe how your brain must work and how this impacts its memory requirements. Then I'll look at the problem from another way by asking, how much do you really know? If you're in a hurry, skip ahead to the next chapter in this video because most of the information in this one is well known and much of it is wrong. I found a range of estimates of the brain's memory capacity stretching from one terabyte all the way up to two and a half petabytes. That's a pretty broad range of estimates, a factor of 2,500, but who's right? At the high end, we can say there are 86 billion neurons in the brain times 10,000 synapses per neuron times 4.7 bits per synapse equals 505 terabytes. Although this is short of the largest guesstimate you can find, it is still much larger than the amount of memory needed for a brain-equivalent AI. Your brain is made up of three main areas, the neocortex, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Although your brain overall contains 86 billion neurons, we generally agree that thinking is the province of the neocortex, with only 16 billion neurons. Now we'll hone our estimate so that each neocortex neuron has about 7,000 synapses, for a total of 112 trillion synapses. If we presume that each synapse takes on one of 16 values, then there are four bits of information in each synapse for a total of 50 terabytes of information. We're getting closer. But the information in your brain is not in some random chaotic web. It has a defined structure. Your DNA, which defines the brain's overall structure, doesn't contain nearly enough information to describe all the connections in your neocortex. Instead, there are repeating patterns of connections. Cortical columns are clusters of about 100 neurons, which are repeated millions of times over the surface of the neocortex, forming the gray outer layer. While the cortical columns have many connections to their nearby neighbors, they have far fewer, longer connections to more distant cortical columns, and these form the white matter in the interior of your brain. If cortical columns are the basic unit of information storage, we now are considering only 160 million columns with perhaps a thousand connections each. I'll get back to these numbers in a moment. If I tell you that Fido is a dog, you can immediately assume that Fido can eat and play fetch and wag his tail. Why? Because information in your brain is organized into a graph of nodes connected by relationships. The new Fido node inherits the attributes of the dog node when the is a relationship is added. Neurons are so slow that a graph with direct connections is the only way this can work. 
Computers are fast, so there are many ways to accomplish the same thing. But in your brain, if information seems to form a graph, as in this example, it must actually be stored as a graph. The graph with attribute inheritance is a huge mechanism for data compression because your brain only needs to store the information about FIDO, which makes FIDO unique. It's the same with faces, words, images, all information. Your brain doesn't need to store all the attributes of anything, only the attributes which differentiate one thing from another. But organizing information into a graph does come with a cost. While your brain obviously has these capabilities, there is some overhead needed to keep track of things like how important is this information? Where should your brain store it? How does your brain handle inheritance? And how do you keep track of your confidence that the information is correct? This overhead obviously can't be handled by single neurons or synapses. This graph approach to information storage dovetails with the observed structure of your brain. Let's consider each node in the graph corresponds to a cortical column. The hundred neurons of the column are about right to handle all the necessary overhead, while the connections between different columns represent the relationships between items of information. Because individual nodes only need relationships to others which make a node unique, this approach easily handles more information than the brute force approach of every synapse represents four bits of information. When we begin to look at what the brain does with this information and how it learns, we'll conclude that the synapse value itself doesn't actually represent information at all, but more likely represents the confidence that the bit of information represented by the relationship is true. And all those thousands of synapses connecting one node to others? Let me give you another example. You know that this is called a cat. That means that there is a connection in your brain with near 100% confidence between the node representing the cat and the node representing the word cat. Now for a moment, this is called a shoe. No problem, your brain strengthens the connection between the thing and the word. This happens much too fast for your brain to grow a new connection. The connection between the cat node and the word shoe node must have already existed with a near zero confidence. Imagine, your brain has always thought that this was called a shoe just with a really low confidence. Huge numbers of synapses must exist with near zero weights, just waiting to act as connections for information which you haven't encountered yet, and may never, while many others within node clusters are handling the overhead needed to make the nodes work. Only a tiny fraction of synapses actually represent useful information. This represents a huge difference between brains and computers. In your brain, because creating new connections is so slow, you need to have zillions of zero-weight connections just waiting to be put to use by having their weights increased. In a computer, since connections are just a few numbers in RAM, we can create new ones almost as quickly as we can change the weights of existing ones. That means we don't need to store the zero-weight connections. If we were to say that your brain's information graph is limited to 160 million nodes, each of which could have 100 useful relationships, how much memory does that represent? On the order of only 128 gigabytes. For that amount of information, we don't need racks of disk drives. We can store that in RAM on a desktop computer. 
Want to test that 100 useful relationships number? Well, how many things do you know about Fido which makes him unique? Remember, you can't use things which are common with other dogs. If we'd said that Fido was a beagle, you'd know even less about Fido individually. Your brain's graph is organized into a hierarchy of classes and subclasses which it builds on its own. If you start describing the unique features of anything, you'll start to slow down after about 10. You'll notice that most of what you know about anything is based on the attributes it inherits from its ancestor classes. Compared with the conventional wisdom I started with, this 128 gigabyte estimate seems ridiculously small. So let's look at it from another angle entirely. Instead of looking at counts of neurons or nodes, let's try to inventory how much you know. When you count up the things you know, you don't get anywhere near our 160 million estimate of the number of things your brain can store. For example, let's estimate that you can recognize 3,000 faces. Your brain doesn't store 3,000 bitmaps. For each face, it stores perhaps 50 features, which make the face unique. Consider that one of these features is nose shape, and you can recognize many different nose shapes. With a single relationship, the face node can define its nose shape. So each face node has up to 50 relationships, which point to attribute nodes. Each of these attribute nodes has some number of relationships to other nodes, which are visually recognizable. But overall, you can see that the brain could recognize 3,000 unique faces using as few as 10,000 nodes. Here's another example. You know perhaps 50,000 words. Each word has nearby relationships to how it is pronounced, so you can say it and recognize it when you hear it. And it will have several longer relationships to the various meanings it might have. But you don't just know about individual words. There are numerous combinations of words which have unique meanings, which don't really relate to the meanings of the individual words at all. ChatGPT, which could be an authority in this instance, says it knows about 250,000 three-word phrases. Some examples include, let it slide, cut it out, drop the ball, spill the beans, hit the road. So as I'm building my list of how many things you know, starting with 3,000 faces, 50,000 words, or 250,000 phrases, here is a longer list of the types of things you know and some estimate of the number of things you know in each type. For each, notice that you know a few thousand, or at most, a few hundred thousand things. Each thing you know must be represented in your brain by at least one node. But the key takeaway is if you're counting things by thousands or even hundreds of thousands, you're a long way from approaching our estimated capacity of 160 million. This is a common sanity check to address the question of is 160 million nodes enough to represent human level intelligence? And the answer is clearly yes, based on the estimates here. If we were to say that your brain's information graph is limited to 160 million nodes, each of which could have 100 relationships, how much memory does that represent? As I mentioned before, it's only 128 gigabytes. Could we get by with 40 million nodes and 50 relationships. Probably, but the only way to find out is to build out such a system and try it. You could run that on your laptop. Certainly much smaller graphs will be useful for something. So how much storage do we need for human-level AI? On the order of 128 gigabytes. 
For that amount of information, we don't need racks of SSDs or hard drives. We can store that in about $200 of RAM on a larger desktop computer. Of course, we won't be satisfied with human-level AI for long. We'll want our machines to know more than us, be faster than us, and be more accurate and helpful than we are. But that's a topic for another video. In the next video, I'll challenge the conventional wisdom about how much computer power we need to build human-level AI. In the same way that we'll achieve human-level AI without racks of storage, we won't need vast farms of CPUs either. I'll show you the great efficiencies of the graph and how the overall size of the graph has very little impact on the computational horsepower requirements. If you join the Future AI Society for free, you'll be notified about our online conversations and can participate in our software development. Of course, likes, subscribes, and comments always help distribute this information to a wider audience. And as always, thanks for watching.